Please uh, join me in welcoming um, Chapo and Logic. Hi, Defcon. Can you hear me? Closer? I can't closer. get closer. How's everybody doing? A good time? All right, so serious business here. Uh, <laughs> uh, what's up? You'll have it in a minute. Yeah, in a minute. All right, so uh, no bio stuff. Uh, we're just going to get right into it. Uh, going to get really uh, off topic for like the first 20 minutes of it until we kind of gradually get on topic, mostly because I like talking about formal systems. So we'll get into philosophical digressions here. Uh, although we are going to be talking about uh, automated security tools and how we need automation, but if you rely on it too much, you can run into problems. Um, but anyway, so on formal systems. This is a game I played a lot as a kid. Um, it, it wasn't that it was challenging as a game, uh, whereas other people, maybe they, they start with the challenge of it, but not us. You know, we could probably do this in a minute um, or less. Uh, what I was fascinated about as a kid is that half of the different uh, permutations or, I guess, com uh, combinations of this are impossible. Um, so in this case, if you guys have ever, and this is interactive, um, if you guys have ever tried to solve this, you know, in order, so you got to get that one all the way up there. I'm totally, I'm going to waste my time just at least get the one up there. Okay, and the two is close enough. Anyway, um, this is unsolvable uh, if I wanted to get one through 15. Um, but I could get 15 backwards, which you can't if you just buy one of these. Nothing else on that. I just find that really interesting. You're welcome. Uh, this is the same kind of concept. Uh, show of hands, uh, who thinks they know why you couldn't solve this just based on this picture? Yeah, cool. Two blues, yeah, they're, they're, every middle square is a unique square. And people that are familiar with uh, Rubik's Cubes, they know that the most important square is the middle one. That's the one that doesn't change, so to speak. I also find this interesting. Um, this is a game that maybe you would never end up playing naturally uh, of chess. Um, it starts kind of like this. Uh, it's a variation of chess. I think it's called Chess 960. You start all the pawns in the right place, but the back pieces you randomize, and the black and the white mirror the randomization. Um, so you end up with a game like that. And all of these are kind of these examples. I need to update. All these examples are kind of fitting the same theme of. Uh, formal systems are not breaking the rules. We're either changing the environment or the starting positions. In these first three examples, we change the starting positions. Here's a couple of uh, examples of changing the environment. 3D, Qbert. Uh, and the, the point is, like, the, the first two were like, yeah, okay, you're, you're being trolled with this impossible uh, situation. But it doesn't have to be that way. Like, in, in this instance, you might actually end up playing a very interesting and fun game of chess. Um, this is another example of changing the environment. Um, I don't, so m some of you may have seen this video. There's this 23-minute video, and I'm only going to do a good, like, my favorite top hits, 50 seconds of it. But it's an impossible, well, not even impossible, it's just a very challenging Mario level that this guy plays and does really well at. But it's funny, it's a funny video uh, just because of how ranty it is. Just look it up on YouTube, like, type impossible Mario level guy rants, whatever, you'll find it. But here's my favorite parts of it. I'll make it a little bit bigger. The level starts out that way. <laughs> That's my favorite right there. <laughs> Yeah, I would have audio, but I'd uh, just splice so much of it together, it'd be all choppy with that. So just check it out on YouTube. It's, it's hilarious. It's more hilarious than that. You are going to have to watch it. All right, so kind of changing gears here um, on wrecking the Earth with resonant frequencies. Uh, and I have a picture here with Tesla because, you know, the whole earthquake machine thing. I'm not going to get in detail with that. I'm just going to kind of skip along uh, sort of on that theme, though. Uh, has anybody ever read this book? Awesome. You, okay. 
Uh, it's by far my favorite book, and not even on a margin. Uh, it, it, my second favorite book would still be a tenth of how good I think this book is. And it's not about computers or hacking, but I would say I learned most of what I uh, know strategically about hacking from this book. It's about formal systems. Um, it's more than that, though. Uh, if you haven't heard of this book, check it out. Um, at least read a preview on Amazon or whatever, but read this book. It's awesome. Um, but about 100 pages deep into this book, the author in between chapters talks about this uh, scenario. Of, uh, and these illustrations are from a friend of mine, so it's not from the book, but there's a tortoise and a crab, and the, the, the crab is kind of the instigator here. He's giving the tortoise uh, a record. Uh, well, the record player, I should say, is supposed to be high fidelity, so high, not only very high fidelity, but it should be able to reproduce any sound. Um, and I'm looking at this as our signature-based system. So the, the crab's trying to foil this, and he has a record that has a resonant frequency either geared for you know the horn or the wood on the record player, but it has a resonant frequency that will cripple that record player and make it not work. So that's the black record there, and that happens. Um, so to try to defeat that, you build kind of a, a more signature-based system that might detect uh, those frequencies. So you have this red needle that is analyzing the record uh, to try to um, avoid this. And you run into problems with that too, because say the record player detects the signature, um, so it decides not to play it. Well, now your record player that's high fidelity is not reproducing every sound. So you fail that way. Or say um, this is just an evasion technique um, and you know, the record still plays. Uh, and still destroys a record player um, like that. So another solution, and, and this is like just cat and mouse, this is not supposed to be specific, but another solution is like, okay, well, let's have several different horns, so when you give it a bad record, um, you can just switch to a different horn that can play that record, but again, you can have a record player with several different tracks and destroy all the, the horns, um, and then again. Um, and that's kind of the theme. The, every system, uh, I wouldn't say it's vulnerable necessarily to exploitation, but I don't think that there's any perfect system just because it does something. So it doesn't have to be exploitation, it could be some kind of denial of service, it could just be doing something that it's not meant to do, which may not be damaging, but it's still not a perfect system because it's doing something that it wasn't designed to do. So now we're going to get into some more lower tech, kind of more familiar abuses, and I'm going to hand it off to... Ruben here. So we're all very familiar with this picture here. I mean, you know, trying SQL injection. So when somebody enters it uh, into a database, it drops or it, uh, SQL injection attack, typical. Right. Uh, but in these cases here, it was more or less, it's not uh, signature based, but it's still abusing a system in, in an odd kind of way. That's why it's oddities. Um, so this guy here, uh, Robert, he um, ordered the, he wanted the special license plate. He was really into sailing and boating and all this great stuff. And he wrote down, you know, the first license plate I want, uh, you know, I wanted to say sailing. If I can't get that, I um, wanted to say boating, you know. And if I can't get that, then I wanted to, you know, eventually just say, what was it? No? no plate. No plate, that's right. So he, you know, he put no, he wrote down no plate. So what, if, what happens is uh, obviously the first two were taken and he, he got a plate that said no plate. Well with that, uh, eventually he ended up getting you know, 2,500 notices in the mail of violations and tickets because every time the cop would write no plate on the, the form, you know, <laughs> yeah exactly, you can see where this is going. So he, would, he got all these violations. So. Uh, same thing with this. So in the first slide there, um, it, it stated, you know, they switched over to none and missing. Um, and this guy, the same issue happened. I mean, he had a plate that said missing and he got violations as well. This guy here, uh, he thought it'd be cute to have his little motorcycle, I, I believe it was, uh, to say no tag. I mean, it, you know, brilliant. And when uh, license plates had no tag on them, uh, the cops would write down no tag, and he, his actually showed up with the 200 violations. So when he got his uh, license plate in the mail, those violations were there already. <laughs> so, so, uh, the same thing with this guy, you know, it's void. Um, the unknown. And then this guy here, uh, I guess his favorite number was seven, uh, and they called him Racer X, you know, Racer X. And he ended up getting 19,000 dollars worth of fines and his quote out of this uh, article uh, was you know he thought he messed up the system so bad that they were going to send him to jail or something for doing this so um, this is just kind of a unique way of showing uh, you know when I guess we're kind of analyzing or not paying attention uh, to uh, specifics in, in certain systems uh, you could really mess things up you know so uh, go ahead and go next one. Um, who's familiar with these? 
and we all know what they do, right? We're who's, from Arizona, so we're really familiar yeah, with Yeah, so these. who still has them in their state is a question. I know they were trying to, okay. Um, so we are very familiar with these, the speeding tickets. Now, a while back, uh, I think it was in Maryland, yeah, Maryland um, these students uh, thought it would be real neat. Uh, they, they graduated from elementary school, and uh, they hated their teachers, right? I mean, who hated teachers? So they would actually photocopy their old teacher's license plate and run through the, the you know, speeding ticket cameras, and those tickets would actually go to their teachers. I mean, there was no validation of who was actually driving the car, and it says pimping because that's what they coined the term. It's, I don't know, pimping ain't easy or something. I don't know what they were thinking. But that, that's how this, I mean, there was no validation, you know, from this whole attack, if you will. So Pirate Eye, does that, anybody know what Pirate Eye is or heard of it or? It's a little obscure. But okay, so Pirate Eye, well, first of all, uh, they claim to be the leader in anti-piracy. Um, you want to go ahead and show the next slides here? Or, yeah. Um, yeah. They're the leader in some other stuff, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they really uh, um, you know, could use a web admin or, or something. Uh, WordPress, it's pretty obvious probably how the attack <laughs> went down. But anyway, Pirate Eye, uh, what they do is, as I said, anti-piracy in movie theaters. Um, this, this story came about because some guy was wearing Google glasses within a theater watching a movie one night. And when he was watching that movie, um, I guess, you know, he ended up getting escorted by, you know, three-letter agency or something. Um, but what this service does is pretty much they put a little camera, if you will, mount it at the top Excellent. of the theater. And once the movie starts, it actually starts rec recording. And their services, it kind of works like a, a SOC, a security operations center. And so they're constantly, that device is constantly scanning three uh, seats at a time for, you know, uh, any recordable devices, camera phones, uh, you know, uh, anything like that. And it got triggered, the, his Google Glasses got triggered by this. Um, so what happens is once it does detect, uh, you know, something that possibly might be recording, they send off a, a text message or an email to their point of contact at that certain movie theater and they say, hey, you know, this guy was recording in your theater, and then eventually, you know, they try to get the guy arrested or whatever. Um, so to attack against that, um, you know, just abusing their systems a little bit and how you could, I guess, yeah, just basically abusing and attacking them, um, we, uh, Logic here came up with Spider Eye, and Spider, because it, I guess it looks like Spider's, you know, Spider's Eye. And, but he actually and so can you. Yeah, go ahead. You can. Oh no, no. Well, okay. Yeah. So this is a uh, this is my Thingiverse profile. Uh, I only have a couple things on there, but this is a iPhone case, and it's I don't even know if it'll fit an iPhone. That's not the point. Uh, but I made it so uh, it fit the like hundred lens or fifty lenses that I purchased. But it's open SCAD format, so you can just change that that one global variable and put a different lens in there. But so it's an iPhone case that you put a little lens in, so it's kind of plausible, like it looks like it might be something that you're recording with. So the idea of that is you go into a theater, put the iPhone case in the cup holder, there's a chair, that's the theater. That's, I, and I told Logic, I said it'd be nice to get like mannequins and make it look like real people, you know, I mean, we just have a bunch <laughs> of, but it'd be nice. All right, so I'm going to take this a little bit here. Um, Barcodes, I've done barcodes or stupid shenanigans with barcodes for quite a while, but I really don't like uh, VIP cards and what they stand for. Um, and they're used for a lot more than what they were originally intended for um, in bad ways. Uh, I think the main reason that they first started, uh, you got a thing called correlated goods. So you got hot dogs and buns, right? Um, if you're a, a grocery store retailer, you can have a, a sale on hot dogs. Um, but then jack up, up the price of buns, um, so then people are still paying either, either equal or more than they expected to. Um, but that's obvious, people would catch on. You know, hot dogs and buns, you might notice that the buns cost more and you'd catch on to that. So you need to use statistics to find uh, like less obvious correlated goods. Um, correlation and statistics, that's just the right, the right tool for the job. So the, the, one of the best ways to do that is give everybody a, a discount card, a savers card, but it's really just data mining for those statistics. So one thing that came out of that, and I think I learned it from my useless MBA, uh, it was it's like in marketing or something like that. Uh, they, it was wine and diapers was a significant correlated good for some reason. And it's funny, but that's the point. Like, it's not obvious, right? So that was the initial reason. And whatever, that's sort of evil, but it's kind of the Diet Coke of evil a little bit. 
Um, so that's their solution to that. Um, but kind of privacy things. So you can figure out shopping preferences a little bit, your hobbies, your clothing size, which even could say a little bit about health as well. Um, but then, you know, smoking, alcohol, whatever, pills, pharma stuff. Uh, they'll know if you own a pet. Um, and I would even, I was going to say birth control purchasing, but there was also the case of not even birth control purchasing, but even like just correlated things that would indicate you're pregnant. There was a big story about that. Um, and then uh, health insurance claims. There, um, I forget the name of the program. I think, it, yeah, it's, it's called Smart Mouth. Smart Mouth. Uh, I don't know if they're still doing it, but uh, HSAs would buy this data right up, and they, they, you might get a claim denied because of your save, saver card. Um, so, yeah, things like ice cream means you're obese uh, to, a, to a health insurance agency. Uh, cardiovascular disease, that's, you know, homogenized milk and meat and cancer, um, you know, additives, chemical sweeteners and all that, which may or may not be the case, but to them it is. Um, and yeah, law enforcement, uh, I think, has been known to use it too, but this case uh, specifically I find interesting. It actually didn't get used in court, um, but it, it, they, they tried to. So Vons, which uh, I think is a s subsidiary of Safeway, um, they had a, a yogurt spill in the aisle. Somebody slipped on it, fell, was hospitalized for about 10 days, uh, and then tried to sue to recoup some of his losses, which I don't really care about the politics of that. I mean, he's probably in the right for doing that, but that's not the point. Um, Vons was trying to data mine his VIP card to try to see uh, how much alcohol he was purchasing to try to build a case against him. Um, they didn't end up using that in court, and my theory on that is that that would be showing their hand. Um, the store, if they started doing that, that would set a precedent that stores would do that, and people might be more skeptical about the cards. But yeah, so uh, one point to that as well, um, not just with these special shoppers cards, uh, but nowadays also they're also you know tracking by debit, credit card, and all good stuff. I mean, they'll print out certain receipts or something that you've bought in the past for something, and you're just like, wait a minute, how'd they know that? You know, I purchased it. Well, obviously, it's tracking it. So, just another good point. And we have one uh, giveaway item. Uh, but we don't have enough for everybody, but there's maybe about 100 of these uh, in the box we have up here. So, after the, the talk, come up and take them if they're here. But uh, this is my VIP card. Um, it, it ends in uh, the digits 2600, 2600. And the zero is the checksum, and it does work. This does work at Safeway. Um, this also works at our local chain um, in Phoenix, Fry's, Kroger. Um, I, it might work at other places too. Um, but the point is we all have the same barcode. And that's funny. Um, when they're data mining, we're one very large customer. So, so you better uh, fight for those gas points because, you know, whoever gets to it first is, is the person that's good on it. And uh, on my same Thingiverse uh, profile that I was talking about earlier, um, and you can just Google Thingiverse and my handle, xlogicx, or whatever. Uh, but uh, I have a list, uh, well, I have, on this side I have a barcode generator, so if you want to 3D print, laser cut, whatever. Uh, and I also have a list of, of valid barcodes that I'm currently using. So if you know of a barcode for a store I don't have, give me just, I don't need your whole VIP card, just the first six digits, and then I have a Perl script to generate the rest and make it end in 2600. But here's some examples, like I, I did a laser cut barcode, um, and totally works, you gotta put it on a black background though, because I actually cut the spaces, um, so what comes through is the lines from the black. Um, this doesn't work anymore, but it's on my cell phone right now, some of the lines have fell off, so it's kind of gimmicky, it doesn't work, whatever. Um, but it did work for the first few weeks, so that was kind of fun. That's just from a vinyl cutter, or plotter, or whatever. Um, you don't have to be as fancy as that though. I just thought the gimmicks were fun. But there's smartphone apps that you can download. I listed uh, four of them here. Um, I think they're the most popular ones. Just make sure to select UPCA for the barcode you're using. Um, I know some phones don't scan, but I think most do just because of the type of screen. Um, or just print it on a piece of paper. Um, the point is use our barcode um, that I have listed on the Thingiverse site. So even if you don't get one of these, you can still use the barcode. Um, and then the last point, what if the store blacklists it? I don't care, it'd be funny if they did, it'd show that we pissed them off enough to make that kind of a difference at least, but still, I got the Perl script, so just get another, somebody else's first six digits and just generate off another one, and there's the central repository of my barcodes that we all can use. So now we're gonna get a little bit more technical. Um, I'm gonna go through the first two, there's like three subsets of things I'm gonna go through. Uh, forensics, AV, and IDS. Um, IDS is my favorite, so I'm going to try to spend the most time on that, which means I'm going to kind of uh, blaze through a little bit of the forensic and AV stuff, and then we'll try to do the most uh, live demo proof of concept stuff for the IDS. So um, first with the uh, forensic stuff. Um, 
Every, anybody familiar with Scalpel? Show of hands. Scalpel, okay. Um, it it uh, carves through a file system for files based off of, uh, they say magic numbers, but it's mostly just the headers and footers part of it. Because um, like magic numbers in Linux, it's more than just headers and footers. There's regular expressions and everything. I've looked through the .h file. But uh, in this case, it's headers and footers and um, also like optionally how far into the file you want to go. Um, so we're going to troll that a little bit. Um, this is just like a loose graphical example of what a file might sort of look like on a file system. It's actually kind of horrible, but here the green and the green is a, a hex dump of that, uh, of just a simple HTML page. And then like you'll have metadata, but that's not part of the file itself, it's somewhere else. So this is the same HTML file. This is a busy slide, I'll zoom around, but um, in the middle here, um, is kind of what a scalp or yeah, what a scalpel signature may look like for an HTM file. Uh, so the first part is just the extension title. The next part is whether it's case sensitive. Um, this number is how many bytes to carve into um, if you don't have a footer. Um, so we'll stop at that point because some signatures don't have a footer. Um, and then the header and the footer. Um, so if we go down here, this is how it would carve. It sees the HTML, starts starts carving the content, and once it hits the HTML closing bar, it um, knows to stop and just carves the whole thing out and spits out a serialized HTM file. So that's how that works. So thinking about how that works, what do you think that might do if that was the contents of a file? Like it's actually horrible. It's really, really bad and we'll get into that. Um, it, <laughs> it recursively like it will go to the first HTML. Um, I'm pointing at my screen right now. That's <laughs> but <laughs> it goes to the first HTML and then it will carve down to this and all these HTMLs will be content. And then it will start at that HTML again and go to that one. Um, and it just keeps going. And then it will start at the next HTML start and it's, it's bad. Um, so I, I could do a live demo but for time I won't. But I did record uh, a demo I did. The tool I wrote, it's in Perl, it's called Magic Bomb. So I'm just showing uh, my directory here real quick. I'm running my tool Magic Bomb. I'm doing a multiplier of 50 which means 50 of every definition in Scalpel generated a payload. Um, and then I'm going to show us what we have as a result, our payload, just to show you how large the payload size is. For some reason, okay. So in this case it's uh, 17K. We're going to run scalpel against it, output directory out. Um, so you see it says like 50 of each file because that's what I told the payload to do in our 17K payload. Now I'm running DU on the output file. That just gives us the actual output uh, that it spit out. This is uh, 17 megabytes. And keep in mind, none of the files that it carved out were actual files. They're all false positives. I'm also demonstrating the audit uh, text file that it puts out. It shows all the, the file sizes of each file. Um, what it doesn't give is a total, which kind of sucks. Um, so in that case I kind of just wrote a little hack Perl script which you're seeing right there um, to parse out and add up all the different individual file sizes. I know it's kind of lame to show code in a presentation but it's like a, almost a 10 liner so whatever. Go on. Howdy. <laughs> yeah, this thing it can do itself. <laughs> what? No, so you know, so I did a pr the Perl script against audit.txt and uh, it's, it's close, 16.7 uh, megs as opposed to 17 flat. I'm only demonstrating that because I'm about to do a really massive payload that I couldn't practically do. So I can do a scalpel and just say just give me the audit. Don't carve, just tell me what it would look like if you carved. And then I can run my Perl script on it to show how damaging it would be had we ran the script that way. So that's what we're doing. I'm creating a payload of 30,000 of each file and it's reading from a scalpel.conf file and that's, that's how that's going. Um, this is actually looking like it's going slow. In real life it goes slower because you see it finished in 90 seconds. Uh, that's what it said. So the payload is 10 megs. May I have your attention please? Pause. Keep your arms and legs in the car at all times. If you're a new speaker, raise your hand. Doesn't matter. <laughs> well, yes it does. No, it really doesn't. <laughs> no, that ain't happening. Who wants this? Yeah, so. Oh, what? <laughs> I'm too fucking edge for this shit, man. I'm not doing that. So, you said you wanted it here. You come and get it if you want. Should I do his for him? Second. Yes, you should. <laughs> All right, I'll do this for him. Who 
speakers do a fucking shot. It's vodka, I got him. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you, gentlemen. Continue. All right. <laughs> Continuing on. Sir Carving, 30,000 of each file. running the Perl script on the audit.txt. And I'll zoom into this uh, astronomical number that it's eventually going to show. <laughs> so we have a 10 megabyte payload. That's 3.7 terabytes. <laughs> and it actually takes like hours to actually, it would take, out, it would take a long time to carve that <laughs> if you have the drive for it. So. We'll get to the point, kind of. A 17K payload, the first thing we did, that's a, a lot of files that it carves out. It might DOS your brain if you're trying to analyze it. 10.3 uh, megabyte payload, so a lot that it carves out, 3.7 3 terabytes. That might DOS your drive. If we did a 100 megabyte payload, that would just DOS scalpel. Scalpel would just break. Um, let's say you have like a supercomputer or whatever. Okay, a gig payload, whatever, you know. Um, so that's funny to me, all that. So AV trolling, um, I'm not even really going to go into this tool that I wrote a little while ago. It's called HIV sneeze. Um, what it does is it just reads a clam AV signature file and then spits out a file for each signature. So then if you were to run clam AV or a lot of other uh, vendors on it, it's going to look like a bunch of viruses. And the, the funny irony is none of them are actually viruses. They're all false positives. It's a way to troll. Um, but a more interesting uh, kind of thing, um, this is, and the highlighting is a little bit off. It's really supposed to be this, uh, highlighting this first uh, byte here. Um, but it's uh, what I call a tumor. Um, and we'll get into how this works. And it only really uh, plays off of a one individual vendor. But uh, so say our virus signature was this binary here, which is actually in ASCII just the letter X. This, this red stuff here says expect us. So this particular vendor, the way it quarantines is it takes the metadata, makes a file out of it, takes the virus, makes a file out of it, XORs both files with the key of 6A, and then puts them both into one 7-zip archive container. So you have, you're, you're left with the dot, or you're left with the 7-zip file, and both of those metadata and virus files are in there, XORed with the key of 6A. Um, it, the idea is to neutralize it so it doesn't rescan again, because it, if you have a virus in its own quarantine file, an actual virus, it will detect it. And we're using that. So before I get into that, I'm, I know some of you might know about the ever so powerful double XOR. <laughs> we're, we're using that too. So here's, here's the, the process. We got, <laughs> okay, we got uh, our, our metadata, the file type, not a tumor. We got our tumor and the, say the virus signature is this string of bytes, which I highlighted in purple here. And then this, the file, it's like a two byte file, but this, this next string of bytes, is not that signature. And I'll, just to like cut to the chase, um, you'll see it, but this here, if you export it with 6A, would be the virus signature. <laughs> so we quarantine it, and that's kind of what it would look like now. So it's still a virus, or uh, you know, to the AV vendor. So you export it again, because it's still a virus, and it just keeps on building up with metadata. So let's see that. And this one's a little bit longer because um, I kind of hate magic. I don't want to show you an awesome, like any kind of tool that's just doing it all for you. Hip sneeze will do this for you, but I'm not going to do that. So I'm going to manually rip a signature out of Clam AV, uh, XOR it manually, combine it manually, and show you what the vendor does to it. So I'm copying Clam AV's main.cvd file just to a local directory here my tumor directory. I'm using DDD or DD to chop off the first 12, 512 bytes because main.cvd is actually tar file but not the first 512 bytes. So I'm chopping that off. I'm untarring it. 
And then um, I'm going to have to edit the permissions. And I don't know why my video is stopping at like the 20 seconds into it each time. Okay, here we go. So now we have our main.db file. Fix the permissions. Show you what the actual file looks like in the raw. And I scroll down here to show some more meaningful names because the first ones are all hexy. Um, so yeah. So now that we see that we have plain text signatures, um, now we can get our hands dirty and play with them. So I'm grepping for a signature that's very tumorable. Uh, it's a Alba IRC worm. I guess I didn't need to grep it again, but that's what I did in this demo. And so the format is the, the virus signature name, an equal sign, and then what follows it, that hex that you see there, is the signature itself. Um, it's just ASCII hex. So we're just going to use uh, the tool XXD to make an actual binary file. So now we have what would be scanned as a virus if we were to scan for it. And then I'm going to cat it out. So you can see it's kind of plain text. It looks like a script. That's the hex stump of it. This is a Perl one-liner to convert it, uh, XOR um, encode it. Uh, it. It's trivial, but I'm using the key of J. Um, J in ASCII hex is 6A, so that's why I'm using J. And I'm just showing side by side. Um, there's the XOR one and the original one. And then I'm just going to cat them both together, and that will be a real payload. That will work. tumor.text. And there it is all together. Like I really like seeing all the intermediate steps. There's, there's no magic here. Copying it to a shared folder because in this demo this was a, a mint VM. So then we're going to go over to Windows VM. Sorry about how grainy this is, but um, I'm copying the text file over to the desktop, and then this is the quarantine folder, so a file pops in. I didn't mention what vendor this is, but if you know what dot bup means, you know what vendor this is. So note that <laughs> it's 3K. And I'm going to try to access the file. So that would be considered an on access scan. So I'm going to open it with Notepad++ and malware. Found it in quarantine. Mm -hmm. um, and then you'll also notice that it's 6K now. <laughs> Tumor. Tumor. It grows slowly. We're going to access it again. Oh, crap. There's two. <laughs> and now it's 8K. So I would say that this tumor, uh, thankfully, is benign. It doesn't repeat forever. Um, I didn't weaponize it because I don't care. Um, I like formal systems. I like abusing formal systems, and I stop there. Now our favorite part. All right, so getting into a little bit of a IDS fun. Um, you skip that. So. OK, yeah, well, this is like the demo stuff. So yeah, let, okay, let's go so to our, this is Snorby. Um, just a yeah, fun so end. our IDS system here, and oh, uh, it's this guy here. Yeah. I should probably zoom into this. Yeah. Um. <laughs> so basically, we see what's going on here is a typical, you know, in a typical sock or a situation here. I guess a little bit of a story. Um, you know, you always have analysts that are sitting on a channel just watching uh, the sim or something or IDS or whatever it may be. In this case, an IDS. Um, a lot of times. Um, uh, especially nowadays, you know, it seems like training is always a, always a hard thing to, you know, come by with training people up in order to analyze these kind of events and, and signatures and what, what everything means. Um, but clearly here you could see, you know, it, it looks like a possible SQL injection attack. And when I, when I see these things, uh, and, and I've even had, you know, people do this in real life, 
You know, they would take this and be like, okay, you know, I see they're trying to attack our server here. Um, let me try to go ahead and validate that and see if it is actually, you know, possible to, you know, SQL injection on this thing. And before we get to that, just notice this is a rule. I want you guys to see this is a rule. This is what it looks like, what it's detecting. It's pretty simple. It's just looking for, I mean, there's a little bit of like, yeah, not case sensitive has to be in the URI, but really it's looking for the word select and version. So somebody could actually just Google for something and maybe in the URI it will say like, well, I want to select the version of some software thing. It's going to look like a SQL injection. Um, so this is uh, in that scenario you could have somebody that might think, okay, well, maybe my site doesn't even use a SQL backend. So let's just put it in the URI bar and see what happens. Now a smart analyst would probably just, you know, take that first piece where, you know, the SQL part was. But, you know, in some other cases I have seen this as well, uh, which is going to demonstrate here. <laughs> I just want to show some of the stupidness of that. Okay. <laughs> so, so the analyst is thinking, well, I'm going to, you know, verify this and post this, you know, to our, our server. And notice, you know, in the URI you got the union select, you got some obscure stuff. We don't know what that is, so that's what we're testing. So let's test it. It's not SQL injection. So it's again just playing with signatures. That's all it is. It's not like elite hack. And so with the uh, uh, cross site scripting, usually your attack vector or maybe your attack vector might be an email or something like that. Uh, this is obscure as hell. The attack vector is a security analyst that is watching an IDS. That's, right. That's our attack vector. So next is a script called 8-Ball. With the rocket launcher. <laughs> yeah, this slide. Sometimes you got to kick the tires of your IDS with the rocket launcher. <laughs> uh, so there, it's not the first tool like this. There was some tools that I, I, I sort of researched but I couldn't get the actual code for it. It might be Vapor but Stick and Snot, those are some big ones. This does a little bit more and I'm actually, it's, it's released so you don't have to hunt for it either. Uh, it's kind of like, uh, this is a very not it, it's bigger than this, but like testmyids.com if you go there, um, it's not even HTML, it just has this text here um, and it plays off of this signature. It's meant to test your IDS as it says to validate that it's working and that's what this tool is doing to you, Paul. Um, I mean I even added throttling to it so you can actually um, make it slow enough to where you're not dropping packets and you can slowly increase it to see where your IDS starts dropping packets to test the performance of it. Um, so we'll just kind of get into this a little bit more. Here's a slightly more complex rule. Um, it's not the whole rule, it's just dot, dot, dot here. So um, unpacking it a little bit. It's looking for awstats.pl. Um, there's some regex in here. So it needs to have configure, update, plugin mode, or like or of those. Um, equal, um, any amount of anything including nothing. Um, and then any amount of alpha uh, numeric text surrounded by pipes or system. So the question is, so could we just do that? Um, a get for that using that cat or whatever and the answer is yes we can. So it triggered that rule and that was the packet. This isn't how the attack would actually work. We're just looking at the signature and going well it's gonna, if you just feed it that, it'll, it'll trigger. So what about automating it? And that's what 8-Ball does. So it literally reads a, a rules file and generates a packet for all of the rules. So you run it, your IDS is going to light up with unique rules. Um, maybe not all of them because regex is hard to deal with backwards, but it does do the PCRE stuff too. Um, so it takes me back to my sock days with the channel flood. I'm sure some of you are familiar with that. So. <laughs> and this I'm going to do live. I'm not going to do a video for this. I just have it just in case. So um, that's fine. This doesn't take too long. Um, here it goes. This is the script running. In green, you have the, the content matches. In red, you have the PCRE matches. So it's actually looking at a regex string, creating a string that would match that regex. It's regex porn. Um, and just sends that all at the, at the IDS. And while that's going, um, I got a couple more slides to go over because this takes like two to three minutes. So I want to make use of my time efficiently. Some tools that I, or some uh, things I haven't added to the script yet but plan to. Um, so the first thing, the UDP, you can do spoofing. So you can light up some of the TI stuff um, or, uh, you know, make it so it's not attributable as much. Um, one of my favorite things and it's like crazy to go over this in 30 seconds or less because uh, it's a big heavy topic and I'd like to get into it more later in a different talk but redos, regex denial of service. Um, this is a bad regular expression. It, it's, in this Perl script there's only two uh, lines here that really matter. 
I'm taking an input and I'm seeing if that input matches that regular expression. So if I run it the first time I say A is and a B. That took one and a half seconds. If you add just a few more A's to that, that takes about ten minutes to see if it matches. That's bad on IDS, that's bad on web apps if it's doing any kind of validation, but it also is taking advantage of somebody writing a really, really bad regular expression. Um, so another thing is long circuiting. Uh, if you do any kind of coding, you know if I have an expression that says if A and B and C and D and E, then fire the laser. So, it, you know, a compiler will be like, well, if, if A is false, the rest of the thing's false. Don't evaluate the rest. So um, the, the long circuit attack is make all of them true but E. So it doesn't match but it takes as long as it, it possibly can to find that out. So if we look at a more complicated uh, rule here, all this stuff in yellow is the stuff that it has to match and then a, a regular expression down here. Um, so we do all the stuff that it has to match and the regular expression is just saying we need the, the, the range, colon, space, bytes equals and then this is a character set so zero through nine dash uh, space comma. We need a hundred of those is what that's saying. So I do four one comma four one comma four one. Ninety nine of those and an X. <laughs> so it's going to like really hurt the performance but it's also not going to trigger an alert. <laughs> and that's funny. <laughs> so some other stuff, I'm just wrapping this up, we're kind of done. Um, well actually but let's see if that's done. Oh, we, we can do it in two minutes, we're good. It finished. So now I'm going to go to um, Snorby up here and just go back to the dashboard. <laughs> that was actually just when I was testing it this morning. I ran the script twice. So um, I'm going to do force cache update. That will take about one minute. And so just to wrap it up, uh, Yara is something that I'm interested in. I, I, I haven't done anything with it, but it would be the same thing. Attention def deficit disorder is also pretty awesome. It's not ours, but um, I guess it uh, kind of poisons memory. And so if you run volatility, it's going to be a little bit nasty. And all your awesome tools. So probably don't have enough time for questions. I'll, I'll leave this up here for um, a moment. I'm going to kind of check to see if, uh, if that's. Maybe I'll just click on the, the sensors and see. There's 200,000 events in here right now. So if I click on it, um, I'm seeing 207,000 events up here. So it just triggered 7,000 events. And they're all unique. I could go to any one of these um, and analyze it. Like it just shot that at it because the rule is looking for just that. And that's what it does. So. That's it. That's all. Thank you.